Good morning, ma'am. Oh, hello, Tarang. I didn't see you in yesterday's session. What happened? Couldn't come because of some personal problem. That's why I'm here today. Could you please discuss what you did in the session yesterday? Okay. I suppose we can quickly go over it. Come on, let's sit. In yesterday's session, we talked about double integration. That is the integration of a function of two variables. But before we talk about double integrals now, let's see if we can remember the definition of the integral of a one variable function. Yes, I do. Could I use the paper here? Yeah, sure. Suppose I take a bounded function f over an interval a, b. I see you have taken f to be non-negative. Yes, because it's easier to interpret this geometrically. Okay. Now, I partition a, b into subintervals. For convenience, I am taking these subintervals to be of equal length. That means you are taking a regular partition. So in this figure, you have divided a, b into four subintervals. What next? Now, I will take a supremum of f in each of the subintervals. That means this, this, and this. With these, I will make rectangles. The sum of the areas of these rectangles form the upper product sum of f with this partition. But it's a little more than the area under the curve, isn't it? Yes, but if we take finer and finer partition, then this difference becomes less. Okay, so you have found an approximation to the area under the curve, but it's an overestimate. Now what will you do next? Now we find the lower product sums. That means you will find the infimum of f in each subinterval. Yes, that will give us this, 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 and this again. And with this, we will draw rectangles. This will give us another approximation to the area under the curve. But this time it's an underestimate, right? Yes. But if you take final and final partition, then this difference between the upper product sum and the lower product sum becomes lesser and lesser. And if they approach a common value, then that common value will be the integral of f over this interval a, b. So what you did was, you chopped the interval into subintervals. Then you formed the upper and the lower product sums. And if these approach a common value, then that common value is called the integral of f over a, b. Now let's come to our main task. How to define the integral of a function of two variables? So let's take a real valued function, f defined on a subset b of r2. Now here, we have taken f to be a non-negative bounded function defined on the interval a, b. So here also we take f to be a non-negative bounded function. And what about d? Let us take d to be the closed rectangle a, b, c, d. We take this closed rectangle ABCD so that we can write it as the Cartesian product of two intervals, say AB and CD. Previously we have drawn the graph of a function. Can't we do the same here? Yes, of course we can, but it's not very easy. 
because now we'll have to work in three dimensions. Now I have some graphics stored on the video cassette here, which I'd used in yesterday's session. We can have a look at those again. Here is the graph of a non-negative bounded function defined on a rectangle. Yes, that's easier. In case of one variable, we interpret the integral as the area under a curve. Here I think we should be able to interpret the integral as the volume under a surface. Am I right? Yes, of course. But you'll see it by and by. Now let's see what the next step should be. You remember we are partitioning the interval into subintervals. So here also we should partition this rectangle. Oh, but that's messy. Let's be more organized. What I have done here is that I have partitioned the intervals AB and CD and then formed this partition of AB cross CD. It gives a more convenient way of defining the integral. Okay, can you now guess what our next step is going to be? I think we'll have to find the upper and the lower product sums. That's right. Now to form the upper product sum, we'll have to take the supremum of f over each rectangle. Now here you can see that this is the supremum of f over this rectangle. Now we form a box with this height and this base. This box seems to be jutting out a bit. Oh yes. Similarly, we form all the boxes and take the sum of their volumes. Do you notice that this sum is an overestimate of the volume under the surface? Yes, and I believe next we'll have to find the lower product sums. Yes, and for that we have to take the infimum of f over each rectangle and form boxes with these heights. So we get a solid whose volume is less than the volume under the surface. That means our volume lies somewhere between the upper and the lower product sums. That's right. As before, we can narrow down this gap by taking finer partitions. Here, this partition is a finer one. Look at the volume of the outer boxes. It has gone closer to the volume we want. And what about the inner boxes? Their volume also comes closer to our volume. So as we keep taking finer and finer partitions, the gap between upper and lower sums becomes smaller and smaller. And if ultimately they approach the same value, then that common value is called the integral of our function f. And it also denotes the volume under the graph of this function. But remember, we can give this geometric interpretation only to functions which take non-negative values. But even though we cannot give the same geometric interpretation to all the functions, still the rest of the things that we did just now hold for other functions also. You mean we partition a rectangle, form upper and lower product sums, and then take finer and finer partitions to narrow down the difference between the two? Oh yes. And so we can talk about the integral of any bounded function defined on a rectangle in the plane. We call it the double integral. Do double integrals help us in some physical problems? Of course, we have seen that they give us the volumes of some solids. Yes, and apart from computing volumes, there are several other applications of double integrals. Consider this rectangular area on the world map. Suppose you want to find the total amount of solar energy received by this area in a day. Now you know that the amount of solar energy received varies from place to place. So we can think of the amount of solar energy received as a function defined on the points of this rectangle. Then the double integral of this function 
will give us the total amount of solar energy received by this rectangular region. Apart from this, there are many other situations in which we can use double integrals. I am sure you also can think of many such situations. Now I am going to give you two situations and what I want you to do is to write down the quantity required in terms of a double integral. You can note down these situations and show me your answers at the next session. A designer has been asked to design a perfume bottle. Now let's see how she designs it. It has a rectangular base of 4 cm by 3 cm and its cross section is a parabola f x y is equal to minus y square plus 4x. How much perfume can this bottle contain? Now the second situation. Suppose the production function of a factory is given by Pxy equals 500x square y to the power 8, where x is the number of persons employed and y is the amount spent in the purchase of raw material in thousands of rupees. Find the average production level if x varies from 10 to 50 and y varies from 20 to 40. So obviously there are applications of double integrals in all spheres of life. So can we go back to the solar energy problem? I have some doubts. Okay. There it is. In this problem, is there any point in calculating the solar energy received by a rectangular area? I would have thought that someone would be more interested in calculating the amount of solar energy received by a city or a state or a country. Yes, I agree. But you see, none of our cities or states or our country is rectangular in shape. That's why I took this example. You mean double integrals can't help us in finding the amount of solar energy received by our country just because it's not rectangular? Oh no, you're wrong there. We can't find the solar energy received by our country or by any other place. It's just that we have to extend the definition of double integrals to non-rectangular regions. Is that possible? Yes, it is. Let's see how. Suppose we have a function f defined on any bounded such as in the plane. We enclose this set by a rectangle T and then define a new function G. This G is such that it coincides with F on S and is zero outside S. You can compare these two graphs of F and G. Now since G is defined on a rectangle, we can find out whether its double integral exists or not. If it exists, then we say that the double integral of F over S is the same as the double integral of G over T. Okay? So we need not talk of double integrals over rectangular regions only. We can talk of them over any bounded set in the plane. But do you mean that every time we want to find the volume or solar energy or any other thing using double integrals, we have to repeat the whole process? Partition, form lower and upper product sums, take finer and finer partitions and so on? Of course not. You see, in general, double integrals can be very tedious. But if we take functions with some nice property like continuity and if we take some special type of regions, then double integration becomes quite simple. In these cases, what we do is that we integrate the function with respect to only one variable at a time. 
I will try to explain this geometrically. This is not a rigorous proof, but you will be able to appreciate the idea more easily. To find the double integral of this non-negative function f, we have to find the volume of this solid. What we had done earlier was to find the volumes of such boxes and to add them up to get an approximation. Now let's try another method. Suppose we fix x. We get this cross section of the solid. You will see that we can find this area by using definite integrals. It is the area under the curve which is the graph of a function of a single variable y. You mean to say that we fix x and integrate with respect to y alone and get this area, right? Yes. We can keep fixing different values of x and each time we will get the area ax of the cross section. Now if we add up all these areas, that is if we integrate ax with respect to x, then we should get the volume of the entire solid. Is it okay? Yes. That means we first integrate with respect to y and then we integrate with respect to x to get the whole volume. Yes. And you could have also reversed the order. That is, you could have first integrated with respect to x regarding y as a constant and then integrated with respect to y. This process is called repeated integration. But let me warn you, there are cases when repeated integrals and double integrals are not equal. But as an undergraduate, you won't have to worry about such cases because all the functions that you will come across will behave very nicely. And so you can safely use repeated integration to evaluate double integrals. In fact, you can solve the two problems which I had given you earlier by using repeated integration. You remember one was about the volume of the perfume bottle and the other was about average production. And don't forget to show me your answers when you come next. Is that all? Yes, ma'am. And thank you.